Hello. Today we celebrate the sixth Sunday of Easter. And during the Easter season, we spend seven weeks focusing on the effects of Jesus' resurrection. And make no mistake, Jesus' victorious resurrection on Easter is an event of such cosmic magnitude that it affects every corner of life. Today, God's Word teaches us that love for our risen Lord means obedience to His commands. That is the focus of God's service today. We'll begin by singing our first hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. As we come into God's presence, let us confess that we have often lived for ourselves, confident in the forgiveness of him who lived, died, and rose for us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. 
Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In His great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. So hear the word of Christ through His called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We sing our song of praise. Father of lights, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Inspire us to think those things that are true and long for those things that are good, that we may always make our petitions according to your gracious will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Apostle explains how we know what love is. The reading is from 1 John chapter 3. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. And this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, 
Let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm of the day is Psalm 66. And Psalm 66 urges God's people to make his name known in all the earth. We read it responsively. Shout with joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. Come and see what God has done. How awesome his works in man's behalf. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God, who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. The Holy Spirit's job is to help the world know the Father through the Son. The Gospel is from John chapter 14. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We continue with our next hymn. Thank 
thanks and praise for words that speak at variance with deeds. Forgive our thanks for walking pleasant ways, unmindful of a broken brother's needs. Open our eyes to see your love's intent, to know with minds and hearts its depth and height. Let thankful days in loving labor spent reflect the truly Christ-like life and light. Grace and mercy, peace and abundant love be to you from God the Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ, and from the Holy Spirit, whom he has promised and delivered to us. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if we were to take a poll and ask people one simple, yet also kind of profound question, the question, what is true love? The answers that we would get if we were polling society as a whole, would be rather, rather varied, right? Like maybe some people would answer that true love is that profound and wonderful connection that, that a person gets when they finally meet the one other person with whom they just fit. That person who doesn't try to change them, but who understands them for who they are, and cares about them deeply, and accepts them for who they are, and supports them in whatever they, they endeavor to do. For some people, that's true love. Other people would say that that is a very, very young person explanation of true love. They might say that True love really is something that can only be developed over the course of a lifetime. It is the, the product of hundreds, if not thousands, of shared challenges and tragedies and triumphs and joys. Others still might argue that trying to define true love is a, a fruitless endeavor because true love is something that's different for each person. So who are we to judge what love is for somebody else? It's too subjective. Yet as Christians, we of course turn to the infallible word of God for answers to questions like these. And today in, in the infallible word of God, we see a definition of true love that is rather different from what a lot of our society might offer as a definition of love. And it is rather definitive. What we also see today in the Word of God that's before us is what that love looks like and how it plays itself out between God and us and how it should then play itself out between us and others. And we hear God remind us that to confess Him, the one who is love in this world, it means that we are also called to put true love, as the Bible defines it, into practice in our lives. So that being said, what is true love according to the Bible? Well, in the epistle lesson that you heard Pastor Hedrick read a few minutes ago, you see a pretty straightforward answer. John says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And so if you turn that into a general principle, you come up with your definition of true love. True love is doing that which is in the interest of someone else, regardless of the cost to yourself. Or if you want to put it in a slightly different way, you could say that true love is a willingness 
to sacrifice that which you have so that others who don't have what you have might have it. See, the scriptures are pretty clear that that's exactly what your God did for you. God gave of his fullness, of of his perfection to fill us in every way that we lacked. Like to quote one of the Psalms, it says, "Our, our tongues practiced deceit, and it says the poison of vipers was on our lips. So what did God do? Well, God sent his son Jesus, who came and preached good news to the poor. And he bound up the brokenhearted, and he proclaimed freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Likewise, we were intent on following our own selfish whims, no matter what the consequences. That's what we all acted like by nature. And so what did Christ do? Well, he came and he said to his father, not my will, not my will, but your will be done. We lived lives that were completely self-serving. We lived as idolaters. So what did Christ do? He, he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So because of his love, because of his giving of his fullness to what we lacked, we now are complete. We don't lack anything because from his fullness, John writes in another place, we have received blessing upon blessing, grace upon grace. Because he poured out his perfect life unto death, we now have life. And so in him we are we're new creations. We're washed. We're forgiven. We are holy. We're righteous. We're able to do good with our lives. We are able to love with our lives. So as these new creatures who have received from the fullness of Christ and have become children of God, this is the new calling to which Jesus calls us. This is the new purpose which God has given to each of us. To confess him who is love with the rest of the world by doing as he did, by loving one another as he loved us. We have to lay down our lives for our brothers. Or John says as well, if anyone has material possessions, more literally, if you, if you read the Greek, a life in this world, he says, well, then we ought to give of that life. We have to give of those possessions to those who don't have it. When John says these things, he's, he's practically applying this new command that we've received to love one another. And of course, as John makes this application, kind of specifically about material possessions, we can apply it broadly to all sorts of aspects of life, right? If you have a life in this world, whatever you have in this world, you have to lay down that life for others. So maybe it's not material possessions, but maybe it's a skill. You have a skill that those around you lack and need, and so you can give from your abundance to their deficiency. That's love. Even if it costs you. Or another example of love means, or would be that if you have friends, and you have family, and and you make friends easily, then perhaps... The way you love is by sharing of your fullness in that regard, sharing your friends, sharing your family with those who are lonely. Loving also means that if you have the will of God, if you know the word of God, you share it with those who don't. You share it, first of all, with people who are making destructive choices that are harming their lives. But more importantly than that, and certainly you always have to follow up that with sharing the forgiveness that you have received in the word as well. Loving means 
sharing what you have, even at great cost to yourself, because this is what your God did for you. Which, of course, is not an easy thing. This is tremendously hard. And why is it so hard? Well, it's so hard because no matter, no matter the fact that we have been washed and made new, in this world we still have this self-obsessed nature that clings to us. And so because of that, our love always struggles to shine through brightly in our lives. Because the reality is, is that whenever you give of yourself, when you give of your money, when you give of your time, when you give of your efforts, when you give of your energy, there is a part of you that always wants it to come back to you. There's a part of us that will never love, at least here, will never love just because he first loved us, but because we want to be loved in return. There's a part of us that every time we give wants to get. And if you don't think you struggle with that too much, then think about this. Think about the last time that you really put yourself out for someone and they didn't seem to notice or care and how you felt about that. So love is hard. It's not hard for that reason only, though. It's also hard because it's hard because when you confess Christ with true love, well, that's going to sometimes involve the truth. And the truth is not always something that people, even if you are being sincerely loving and just want what is best for them, and you know it's going to cost you to share it with them, the truth is not something people always appreciate. If you've ever had the opportunity to share a hard truth with someone who is in need of hearing a hard truth, perhaps turning a, a grown child from a sin or confronting a fellow believer with, with a destructive choice that they were making in their life, you know how hard that can be. Or maybe the way we should be thinking about this is the last time somebody confronted us with a hard truth and how we responded. Was our instinct to thank them for their love and their concern and their courage in bringing up such a difficult topic, or perhaps were we a little less than thankful? So this is hard. Confessing Christ with true love is a, is a tall order, but it is, what, it is what your Savior, who gave his life for you, has called you to do, because it's good. It's, it's, it is good. It is of God. Dear children, John says, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. And my friends, it's pretty clear that it can't, it can't be any other way either. You know, we can't listen to all of this today and say, well, you know, that'd be nice in a perfect world. John, John says this, Inspired by the Spirit, John says this, anyone who does not love remains in death. So you see, a faith without deeds isn't really faith. That's what the whole book of James is about. Or as John himself says in another, one of, uh, in another place in one of his writings, no one who is born of God continues to sin. In other words, nobody who is a child of God can willfully go on sinning. Either we are children of light or we are children of darkness. Either we are born of God or we are born of the devil. Of course, we are born of God, brothers and sisters. We are born of God because we do love one another. I see it. I see it among all of you. I see it in my own family. Not perfectly. But we do love one another. The evidence is there. It's just that as your shepherd in Christ, I'm here to urge you to do so more and more. And to find your strength to do so in the one thing that can actually strengthen you to do so, which is 
the power of Christ's love that first came to you and the power of the Spirit whom he has sent to dwell within you. See, it's only, it's only rain that softens a hard ground and enables it to bud and flourish, right? And, and so only the refreshing rain of God's grace on our own stubborn, selfish, hard hearts is what can soften us a little bit so that we can begin to bud and flourish in our lives of love for each other. Only if you are constantly imbibing the, the forgiveness that God has given you and you are recognizing the depth of it and you are recognizing the results of it and you are recognizing and rejoicing in, in the blessing of it, will you be able to then extend that love to others, especially when that love means giving to others who will not or cannot repay you. When we do that, though, when we, when we do keep our hearts fixed on things above, where Christ has given us or blessed us with all things, well, then true love can begin to flourish among us. What's more, when we also learn not just to find our joy in the ways in which we are repaid when we love other people, but to find our joy in the act of loving others itself. In other words, when we find our joy in simply being like Christ to someone else, in being an imitator of God, in being Christ to someone else, being his body, well then, it becomes easier to love as well because we don't have to always hope for something to maybe come back and then get frustrated when it doesn't. Instead, we can just rejoice the moment we expend ourselves on someone else because therein we have our reward. Of course, when the entire Christian community is dedicated to loving one another with true love, that that also is just going to make it easier and easier to exercise true love among ourselves because it, is, because it is through our fellow believers that our Lord typically cares for each member of his body as one member expends itself for the benefit of the others. Now, I can't paint a false picture here for you. The, the reality is that this side of eternity because of the sinful nature that still clings to us. Our love for each other is always going to remain but a dim reflection of the love of God for us. Yet praise be to God that because of Christ's love for us, our lack of love for one another is and always will be forgiven. And God's love for us is not shaken. Just don't receive that love in vain. The unbeliever says, show me what you do, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll listen to what you say. So empowered by the gospel and filled with Christ's spirit, let's show them Christ's love. Let's confess our Lord. Not just with our words, not just here, with all our actions, and in truth. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and your minds through our loving Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we confess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. God of mercy, keep us from the doubts and fears that prevent us from knowing the fullness of your peace. Teach us to trust in your word and to believe with all our hearts in Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins and raised for our justification. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, bestow on your church your Holy Spirit and all his gifts. Grant us pastors who will preach faithfully and ears to hear your word proclaimed. But keep us from merely listening to your word. Help us to show our love for you by doing what it says. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of might, guide the nations and their leaders in the paths of peace and justice. Bless us with wise, faithful, and just leaders who will defend us against all our enemies, foreign and domestic. Make us wise and discerning citizens who use the gift of liberty for noble purposes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, teach us to love one another as you have loved us. Guide us so that in our lives we may reflect the love of Christ. Deliver us from all that would threaten our homes and families. Protect the police, firefighters, disaster relief workers, and medical personnel who help us, as well as the places where we live and work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray in your name and as you taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the glorious Father, who by his power raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, give you the spirit of wisdom to know the hope to which he has called you. And may he preserve you in body, soul, and spirit until our own resurrection on the day of Christ Jesus. Let all God's people say amen. 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 Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. God's service concludes with our final hymn. Let's be honest.